Okay, welcome back to Oracle Open World. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract that ceiling from the noise. I'm John Furrier, joined by my co-host Dave Vellante, and our special guest is uh, uh, analyst, chairman of Constellation Research uh, and uh, maverick in the software world, uh, Ray. Welcome back to theCUBE. CUBE alumni, tech athlete. Uh, so what's the, what's the take here? Well, this is, they're trying to go for something different here. Um, they are really trying to focus on innovation. They're thinking about you know, how to incorporate big data, social, mobile, um, trying to weave the database story back into hardware. So, What's the Twitter stream like last night? So Larry gets the keynote, so they won a couple matches. He's feeling good, he had a spring in his step. What, what, what was your point of view of the whole uh, keynote? Because you were obviously streaming like crazy, streaming your analyst view, point of view at the uh, keynote. What's, what's your take on what Larry said and the reaction? You know, Larry gave a product feature demo, um, like no other CEO can. And uh, obviously he knows the technical details. I think the big deal was the fact that you could do these dual in-memory databases and get performance out of it. So I think if he could summarize whatever he did up there, was like, look, we got in-memory covered, we got performance covered, it's 100x more fa faster, and you know what? We can do it cheaper than anybody else. That, that was his message. So Ray, you wrote a great blog post, uh, post day zero and day one. It went around the, you know, the internet and everybody was, was referencing it on Twitter. But basically calling into question, can Oracle keep innovating? Your point was that, look at Oracle, when it decided to start writing checks, bought a lot of companies. Half the attendees here, they're claiming 60,000, half are from companies that Oracle bought. Companies that typically wouldn't, would, previously wouldn't do business with Oracle, or didn't typically do business with Oracle, went out and you know, did business with companies like PeopleSoft and Oracle Alternatives. And your, your premise was, or your question was, can Oracle innovate and appeal to that crowd? You know, do you think they're, they're doing what they need to? And, and really, what did you mean by all that? Yeah, so I think you know, when you look at the Oracle base, there's the traditional red stack. Those are the folks that came up with database, did middleware, did applications. Um, that's the core of the Oracle base. And for a lot of them, it's about driving down costs, simplifying infrastructure, making sure everything is integrated, and, and that's what they're looking for. Uh, the other sets of customers came in through acquisition or accident. And those Oracle customers by accident, what they're looking for was really innovation, right? They bought the startup. They bought the company that became Siebel. They bought the company that became PeopleSoft. They bought the company that became Vitru, right? They bought the company that became Oblix. It didn't matter what it was. They were looking for the best of breed sets of applications. And so what's happened in the marketplace is that, you know, those companies all been subsumed by Oracle, commoditized into the Oracle infrastructure and in what we call the red stack. And the question is, can they keep innovating at that same pace? Can they find that next piece? And so, I don't know, we've been walking the floors trying to figure out how much do Oracle customers want innovation and which set of customers really need that. Well, and, and it's an age old you know, discussion in the software business. Do we go best of breed or do we go fully integrated suite? Oracle's trying to do both, have its cake and eat it, eat it too. It's a very difficult thing to do and I'm not sure if there's an example of any, any company that's been able to do it. Well, let's kind of unpack the cloud strategy. So, Oracle has made statements about how they do more you know, cloud business than, than Workday. And of course they're adding up right now and Eloqua and, 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 and Taleo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's factual, but you know, Workday's got all the wood behind one, one arrow, so to speak, you know, I guess pun intended in old Scott McNeilyism. So what's your take on what's going on there? Workday's obviously smoking hot, uh, Oracle doing a lot of business, but uh, there's a classic case of best of breed or you know, integrated suite. You know, that's a great question. Um, me and my colleague, Holger Mueller, we've been actually here trying to understand, is Workday really in the lead with HCM, or does Oracle have a shot? And one of the things that we've been discovering is that we just talked to a customer that was the CIO of a university. They put up um, their whole system, the entire Oracle HCM, Taleo, Talent, a whole bunch of things in 17 weeks. Weeks, not months, right? So we're actually starting to see those deployments come to life. I just think Oracle hasn't done a very good job of telling that story. Well, um, Oh, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. You, you wrote, uh, I think, that in Constellation, 
in looking at deals, I think you said that the vast majority were going to work day, like unbelievable number of, you know, uh, let's say uh, let's say you looked at 100 deals, it was like 80 went to work day, you know, 19 went to SAP and one yep. went to Oracle, it wasn't those exact numbers, but or rough order of magnitude. It is, and, and I think part of it is really, the clients that we tend to look for are what we call early adopters. They're market leaders and fast followers, and they're the folks that tend to push the limits, they're thinking about an all cloud strategy. Um, what we didn't really tap into is this marketplace of people that were cautious adopters or fast followers that were now jumping into the cloud. And I think that's Oracle's core base, right? The people soft user trying to figure out, I'm going to go to 9.1 or 9.2, or you know, I'm going to go to Workday or Oracle Fusion, and, and that's really the challenge. Yeah, so um, I want to stay on this, this theme of Workday for a minute. So, has Workday become acquisition proof in your, in your view? Are they, uh, <laughs> or, or are they a potentially a target for somebody like Oracle? You know, I think Workday has worked very hard to be uh, acquisition-proof as you can. Look at the ownership structure, look at where the shares are, look at who owns parts of the company. Um, they definitely want to remain independent. So, um, I want to come back now to innovation. So you also talked a little bit about, in, in, in one of your previews that I was reading, about uh, uh, the customer experience as an area that Oracle needed to innovate. And of course, we've heard a little bit uh, about that. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Right, customer experience is picking up. And once again, this is another area where Oracle has the leading CRM vendor, Siebel, and they've got to deal with this issue. Do I stay on Siebel? Do I go to Fusion CRM? Do I you know, upgrade the Salesforce or upgrade the Fusion? C I mean, the question here is, is the same problem. And so when you look at a broader issue on customer experience, it's just not sales. We're talking about looking at the entire life cycle from marketing, sales, support, commerce. We're seeing all that come back again. And so acquisitions on social, so such as Vitru, acquisitions that were happened around you know, Eloqua, they're all part of this customer experience right now. And so what Oracle has a shot at is really redefining where CRM is. In the CRM world, what happened was you know, lots of focus on management, very little focus on customer, and the relationship piece was completely ignored. And that's what they're trying to address here when we talk about customer experience and customer centricity. Dave and Ray, I want to ask you guys as analysts, you guys both been covering the space for many, many years. Um, we talked about, Dave, four years ago, the you know, Apple strategy that Oracle had, purpose built, big theme here again. Um, obviously Apple's had some great success, Android obviously more open, um, SAP's been talking about open. Guys, is that playing out, Ray and Dave? What do you guys think, observations, anecdotes, uh, any data you can share around you know, functionality around this notion of a soft lock-in? I mean, soft lock-in being where, okay, hey, you know what? This is lock-in, but it works. Oracle has always seemed to deliver the functionality at the right time to get their customers from switching, because it's hard to switch, but they just kind of deliver that last trendy piece of technology. This, this year it's in memory. What's your take, guys, as analysts? Well, I mean, my, my take is that it you know, comes down to, first of all, strategy, you know, it's the old magic quadrant strategy execution, right, to, to quote a bromide, but, but the strategy is a good one. I mean, Oracle basically saying, hey, we're going to try to change the game, we're going to vertically integrate, we're going to go with this red stack approach. There really aren't a lot of companies that can do that. I would argue IBM can do it, and guys like EMC, VMware, and Cisco do it through partnerships, uh, but that's what customers want. They want this vertical integration. Now, whether or not Oracle can be best of breed, I think is the, is the big question in my mind. Are they best of breed in servers? No. Are they best of breed in storage? No. Are they best of breed in, in, in apps? Well, not really. Are they best of breed in a database? Yes. So, what's your take, Ray? Uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, we're down to I mean, the only two companies that can probably deliver this end-to-end -end are IBM and Oracle. And Oracle has a strategy of basically, you know, high volume, um, high value. Whereas IBM has a strategy of high margin, high value. And it's a different game. And you see that across the board. You know, if you're looking for something that's very deep, customized, able to go best, you know, best in class everywhere, IBM is there with services to help. Uh, if you're really trying to commoditize innovation and infrastructure in the stack, that's where the Oracle Red Stack plays a role. And, and, and this is the battle that's been going in the marketplace, really between these big chess masters, uh, between Steve Mills and uh, Larry Ellison. Yeah, and of course, John, nobody loves to criticize Oracle more than when we do in the Cube. We have a lot of fun with it. But, but you have to give Oracle props. You know, financially, it's working. This company has 39% operating margins, 45% operating margins last quarter. It's thrown off $14 billion in free cash flow in the last 12 months. That's nearly as much as IBM for a company that's much, much smaller. I mean, you're talking about a $39 billion company versus a yeah. $100 billion but company. I mean, Ray just talked about Workday, 17 weeks. I mean, the cycle times now for deployment is critical. You got SaaS, you got cloud. You that was Oracle, 17 weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's like, oh my God. Like, yeah, so yeah that's Workday, like, 17 days. 17, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I mean, look at the differences on I mean, cycle times. What impact has that had? SAP's been talking this for a while. Um, they've struggled in the cloud, 
Ray, what, what's SAP's uh, comparison here? What's their answer? Well, actually the long-term competitor for Oracle in the space is really SAP success factors. Yeah. Because end-to-end, -end, the payroll option is going to be the big challenge. Right? People are tying things back to payroll, people are tying things back to integration. Um, Workday is probably going to have to partner to build out the rest of the payroll. Um, and and that, you know, that takes time. Payroll is not one of those fun things. I mean, you got to do with regulatory changes in Brazil and you know, something changes in Poland where regulations change all the time. That doesn't make it easy. Well, what, about core, what about core HR for, for SAP? I mean, they got success factors for, for the sort of talent management, but the core HR is still the legacy SAP base. And mashing those two together, I, I, don't, I don't see it as trivial. I and mean, look at how long it took Fusion. Uh, uh, so I, I, I frankly think Workday has a big advantage there, don't you? Um, it's really an issue of time. It's a question of who's going to win over the PeopleSoft replacements, uh, who's going to win the uh, replacements over SAP. I mean, these are 20 year cycles when people replace HCM systems. This isn't something you do all the time, and the good news is we're just in the middle of this. What about the big data? You heard uh, Thomas Curian and Mark Hurd this morning talking about big data, almost acting like they invented it. Re revisions history, you called it for cloud, I'm calling it revision history big data. We heard about you know, key value stores and Hadoop connectors and in-memory databases. What's your take on all this? Uh, <laughs> Is so, it window dressing or are they going to be a major player here? So Oracle actually, that's one of their strengths and it's the fact that the analytics layer is both in the middleware side and also on the app side. And one of the things really about big data, it's not about how you're describing it, what kind of data, how fast it's moving, where it's sitting. There's really this pathway of what we call data to decisions and how we take data in all the different types, translate it back to information, bridge it to upstream and downstream systems, and then tie that back to insights. Really the question here is, what questions can I answer? What patterns can I surface? What's out there that's important in there? And then of course, how do we take the next best action? As we were talking at the Tableau event, right? I mean, the visualization piece, like, that's the place where everybody's weak, right? But Oracle's got the piece on the back end to be able to bring this information up and really actually make sense of it on a business level. Well, I wanted to ask you about the visualization piece because we didn't hear much about that this morning in terms of, of big data. Is that, a, is that a partnership play? I mean, Oracle really likes to own everything. So, I doubt that's going to be a partnership well, right, play. So what's <laughs> their play in visualization? Are they, are, they, are they there? I just don't know. I mean, you know, we had a chance to take a look at the new usability and user experience, and I think it's worth taking a look. Um, I think they've done a great job on the UX team to actually change that. Um, it's not at the same ease of use as a Tableau or ClickTech mm -hmm. in the marketplace, but the fact that it's getting there, right? Everybody's spending a lot of time on visual analytics. Um, if you look at SaaS, the same thing's been going on there. Everyone's making that investment because business users want visual analytics. Mm -hmm. You guys mentioned, I, you mentioned IBM, okay. Um, engineered system by Oracle is obviously Sun, and you know, IBM just announced a billion dollars donation to Linux. Obviously they have very aggressive in OpenStack, um, a different approach on the cloud. How would you grade the overall Sun role in the Oracle engineering systems? Good, medium, high marks? You know, I think that's one of the crown jewels, what's inside Sun Labs. I mean, you remember going to the Sun Lab <laughs> days? All that innovation that was in there. Um, still a lot of it being untapped inside the Sun war chest. Uh, but I think, you know, the problem is, uh, we're going into these 30, 40 year cycles, right? Back then, you know, cloud was really time sharing, mainframe time slicing. Uh, you know, the AS400 was the box. That's what we're talking about, engineered systems. All this stuff working in one box. <laughs> right. um, but here's the reality. Software's getting so complicated that you really just want to buy it in the box or pick it up in the cloud. And I think that's what Larry Ellison's betting on. The fact that, you know, customers aren't going to want to put this stuff in themselves, want to manage it, and that they can get the scale. Now, let's be honest, the Sun acquisition has been a drag on Oracle earnings. Um, it's hardware is a tough business to kind of win. I mean, you look at Dell, you look at HP, you look at Sun. It was it was a slog to the end, and so I think adding software to there's giving them the margins, and, and that's really one of the pieces that we can get some advance uh, toward. Yeah. So, John, I wanted to ask you a question because at our editorial meeting the other day, you were talking about you know some of your developer friends and, and sort of their perception of Java. We had data stacks on earlier. We were talking about open source and Oracle's open source mojo, or maybe lack thereof. Uh, but they, they own Java, they own MySQL. You had made some comments the other yeah. day about that. I wonder if you could share that. Well, those. I mean, look, we've been looking at a lot of the Amazon um, work. We've done a lot of research on that. And the young developers essentially are not, are, that are new school, are new to Java. And Java was built back when the overhead and the language was built to be optimized for the deficiencies in, say, hardware and integrated systems, or it wasn't as tightly coupled on the operating system side. So you had a lot of disparate parts working together. And so Java is kind of like a, uh, a 40 plus language. You know, if you're over 40, you Java is great. But the new kids who are using, say, Amazon stacks like Node.js or Elastic Beans or DynamoDB, these stacks are fully integrated and they, they're not loading Linux patches. It just works. You can do some like node programming. You can just load stuff in there. So it's all integrated into the stack. So the young guys aren't into the Java. It's like, ah, Java, I'm going to be forced to use that. So 
there's kind of a cultural psychographic profile now developing in the developer community where, hey, I, I don't really want Java. I got Python's got traction, other languages, so Ruby. Ruby and the front end. So rapid application development needs to be enabled by some of the hardened systems that we talked about. That's why I think this notion of functionality um, being a, a requirement over lock-in is going to be driving it. I mean, lock-in's okay if it's just completely abstracted away the complexity. If the developer community can be enabled to do whatever they want to roll out apps. They shouldn't have predicated systems based upon this language for this, that language. Give me some Rails. I want to program a front end. I want HTML5 on the, on the edge. And that's kind of the enablement, Dave. And that's kind of what I'm seeing about this, this, this new generation. Our generation, updating new Linux patches. That just doesn't happen anymore. It's all automation. You're seeing the automation message loud and clear. So again, something to watch for uh, in, in, in that. Yeah, so Ray, I got to ask you, so you know, Larry always saves his best stuff for midweek, right? Yeah, he's talking about product. He is the best product pitch now that Steve Jobs is gone. He's the best CEO at pitching products and, and I think has patterned a lot of his uh, pitch after that. So, so what do you expect to hear from Larry uh, tomorrow uh, in, his, in his big keynote? You know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see where he ties all this together. How the database, the engineered systems, internet of things, big data comes together. So maybe we'll see that. Maybe we'll see a brand new pricing model. Uh, I think it's still up in the works. I'm not sure. Maybe he'll bring home the America's Cup. Yeah, right. <laughs> if they do, that's what he's going to talk about, I would imagine, right? If not, who knows? Guys, so final thoughts on, um, on the conference. Ray, I want to ask you, you're out doing, talking to all your clients and, and getting the lay of the land with your team. What's, what's your takeaway right now in terms of you know, the things that are surprising you here and what's not surprising? What did you expect and what didn't you expect? You know, I, I think when we're in this analyst, media, press um, community, um, we tend to be thinking probably three to five years out. And all the things that we're talking about three to five years ago are now realities for the clients and customers here. They're asking about it. You go to the HODA, the hands-on demo area, and they're just going in and saying, hey, how do I try this social thing? Um, you go up somewhere else, they're like, how do I get this mobile initiative in place? Um, people are just warming up to all these things that we've been evangelizing and talking about early, and I think that's really a reflection of the Oracle customer base. The cautious adopters are waking up and saying, yeah, it's, it's time to start moving. Yeah, I've heard about big data. What do you, what do you got to show me? And, well, they showed three, what, two CEOs this morning and a guy from Thompson Reuters, right? You had the CEO at NYSE, CEO of Boeing. Oh, you had the, the guy from uh, SoftBank. Hey, Larry, hey, Mark. I mean, they're talking you know, CEO speak, and that's, that's a big advantage for Oracle in my view. Dave, what's your take so far? I mean, you, you got in the ground late last night, got, you caught the back end of the keynotes, and this morning, what's your big takeaway? Well, I think it's a, a lot of consistency. Heard said it today, I, I hope it sounds like repetition, because this is kind of what we said last year, this is what we're saying this year. I think they're getting the story together, certainly better in, in the whole big data and analytics piece. I think they added a little meat to the bone, but I, I, I didn't see a lot of surprises. The, 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 the customer experience thing is a bit of a surprise to me. That's something that I want to dig into. I haven't actually seen it, so Ray, I'm going to take you up on that uh, <laughs> suggestion and go poke at that a little bit. How about you, John? What, 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 well, what, I mean, what I'm just, to me, it's about the in-memory thing. I think, I think Oracle, to me, is always a Johnny come lately at the right time. You know, they have, <laughs> they're right at, the, right at the finish line at the right time. You know, all the startups race in there, they get the new technology. It's almost like Larry just uh, sitting in a boardroom coming off the boat going, ah, we got that too, just make that happen. You know, so, and as customers are big and the switching costs are still large, right? And the cycle times are right getting on. smaller, but still, it's hard to rip and replace an Oracle system. And, you know, Larry just kind of has that sales inhibitor mindset. What? See, inhibitor, no, I got I to gotta drop that in there. Yeah, they're, they're great at optimizing timing for releases and products and, and when things are important. I mean, look at that long name, Backup Recovery, what was that? That was a B-R-L-A, <laughs> yeah, 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 I think yeah, that's what yeah. we're going to call it now. Well, you know, they forward. got the storage group, they got some new mojo over there in the storage team. Um, they had a recent uh, executive leave, and now they got kind of a new Scott Jenner over there, uh, XQ Logic executive, and next uh, Nirvonics. Um, Ray, I also want to ask you about some of the things going on in the industry. I see we saw some news, uh, Gary Bloom is now the CEO of Mark Logic. What's your take on that move? Because he's an old time Oracle guy and a very tough guy. Well, the Mark Logic guy went to host analytics. <laughs> so that's a little switching around in the uh, big data world, I think. That's people are changing so. their jerseys all the time. What do you expect from, from him over there? You know, I, I think it's taking it to the next level, right? I mean, there's the need to grow Mark Logic uh, and, and to get it out in potentially an OEM strategy, building out uh, analytics uh, further, so. Do you think the startup community and the in-memory is going to have legs, or do you think the bigger players are going to co-opt that trend? I think they have a lot of legs. We're still early in big data. There are different things happening. The other day we were talking to a company, IASD, they're doing topological data analysis. That's pretty cool in terms of how they're figuring out the connection of endpoints and the closest and how that creates patterns. So they're using that for drug discovery, fraud, uh, and other kinds of uses. So I think we're very early in terms of all these patterns emerging. 
Ray Wang, tech athlete, founder, chairman of Constellation Research, obviously chief analyst over there, great team developing. Obviously always fun to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for coming in uh, and sharing your perspective. We'll be right back with our next guest here inside theCUBE, our flagship program, we've got the advantage for the ceiling. We're live here in San Francisco for Oracle Open World. We're broadcasting live, CNBC is broadcasting live. We'll have all the signal from the noise, stay with us.